just accidentally stumbled down the wormhole of fidelity, but I realized something in the process. Uh, a lot of the vintage recordings had a higher noise floor. And so we think of fidelity in terms of the white noise or the noise from the equipment or the noise from the electrical processes in the environments. And so uh, it's like when you have a recording on just a mic, it's picking up a noise floor just from the atmosphere, but also from its own internal circuitry. So anyways, um, so that's why it's the signal to noise ratio, I guess. That's what it, anyway, so oh, in the past, they didn't have like the noise suppression technologies, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're listening to the recordings, they were layering this noise from the recording processes. So they were trying to probably filter some of it out and then, you know, finesse it. And that whole process, I think, is what starts the whole process of the audiophile wormhole. Because there's a magical quality through this force of uh, noise. And then it's also the idea of excitation through the, you know, manipulation of the noise floor. So it works. Ultimately, what I'm getting at with all this is it works like a groove shadow. So I'm the creator of Groove Shadows, so I, I don't know. <laughs> but <clears throat> so um, my whole thing I've been thinking about the last few days since listening to some tracks that were comped, I was thinking about how white noise is basically uh, a key to understanding like this fidelity effect of, of quality audio and um, especially quality microphones. Like, these things produce a noise impression where the, the no, no, noise floor is a little bit higher or, and somehow it's sweetened, right? So the two things to me that mattered the most in this fidelity research was speaker recording modeling and then also um, the saturation of the noise, the white noise, the pink noise, the recording noises. So that's my, I guess my thesis is that the fidelity that we, th we think of in terms of the old recordings is really just the accumulation of the sum of the mixing desks, the channels, all the noise from all the gear, and then finessed by engineers in a musical way. Um, sorry, I just doing a Christopher Walken impression. I'm st stuck in that voice. So, anyways, the warmth um, was provided basically from pure distortion. And the distortion was just a little bit more musical because, again, they would later on finesse that in post, and then they would also... Uh, have these, you know, tube amps and, you know, different, different uh, amplification processes and, and equipment that masked that distortion, but it was still distortion ultimately. Um, and it happened in multiple points. So it wasn't like abrupt digital distortion, which is very obvious when it happens. You have to be in a special environment to hear the kind of distortion that was going on with uh, the kind of distortion they made back in the day. So once they added all the tracks together, it's barely audible. And there's a thing, there's a phenomenon in music where you can distort uh, an instrument in a piece, but once everything is put together, you may not hear the distortion. And I do not know quite how that works or why that works like that, but it just does. And it's a way of getting more punch out of your material, unfortunately. So... Um, then I go through how the track, once it was introduced, um, it raised the noise floor as well. So if they had any kind of compression, de any kind of dynamic application when they, in the recording process that would sort of attenuate the signal, that means it would also attenuate the noise floor. So when you're attenuating the noise floor, you arrive at exciter. <laughs> how crazy is that? Because exciters basically, they're just, you know, adding those harmonics and isn't attenuating the floor of the noise doing something extremely similar because basically that's a, that's a similar sonic um, impression in terms of the frequency range. You just have a high-end brilliance or a hiss or whatever, and it's so like barely audible that it adds a, a nice aesthetic as opposed to a harsh aesthetic. Now, in, in, in finalization of all this rambling, I'll say that I think that this whole concept of introducing this vintage groove shadow, which is the vintage recording process, 
It created this impression of this era of this very specific style of sound, in addition to things like the spring reverbs they were using and you know the cabinets and the ways that they were recording and the types of button microphones, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the, the impression that it made was so impressionable that it other producers from later eras create the wall of sound based on the wall of noise from the uh, vintage recordings. And that noise made the music more magical. And that's probably why they became so obsessed with um, this wall of sound, because it just makes a, an encapsulation to the listening experience of the track, creating its own world, you know, creating its own environment. And that's been an obsession of mine is to make, when I make a song, the song is its own world. It's not just a song that sounds like somebody on the radio. It's a song that's its own world. And that's why you would not discern it as a pop track or a, uh, you know, as something familiar to you. It's its own world. And that's what I appreciated as, uh, from the great com producers and composers. They would create a, an entire world uh, based on their palette that they chose for the song. Anyway, this is really, really deep. Uh, but this, I just happen to just scratch the surface. It doesn't have to go deeper than this. We don't got to do math, folks. But what I'm saying is um, the, the, the keys to this are the white noise, the speaker modeling, and then an understanding of how we got to where we are based on where we came from. It was the aliens. <laughs>